to Fruity Knitting. I'm Andrea. And I'm Madeline, and this is episode 122. Fruity Knitting is a 90 minute program bringing you knitting inspiration from around the world, as well as extra snippets of travel, history, and storytelling that we hope adds joy to your life and brings a big smile to your face. Yes, we certainly do. <laughs> and I'm back in Germany after spending four months in Australia living out of a suitcase. I'm very happy to be home and I'm especially happy to have Madeline sitting with me on the couch again. <laughs> and it's also been great to have cuddles with our gorgeous dog, Jack. Yeah, Jack went crazy when, when you came back. He gave me such a warm welcoming, which was beautiful. And then for the next couple of days, he, he followed me around like a little shadow, never letting me out of his sight. I think he was frightened that I was going to disappear again. But he's completely back to his normal contrary self. So if I call him to come and he doesn't particularly want to, he's back to doing it like this, literally. He'll go, mm, if I have to come, I will come, but in my own time. <laughs> he's such a naughty boy. So we have a fantastic program for you today, full of wonderful knitting. Our feature interview is with the fabulous Marie Wallen, who's recently released another splendid collection of feral designs in her book, Cumbria. So this interview we recorded during our Yorkshire trip last year, and we're finally releasing it today to coincide with this new Cumbrian collection, because Marie talks a lot about the designs during the interview. And you're going to learn a lot through this interview because she tells us or she shows us exactly how she combines the colours and patterns together for each design. And she also shows us how to change the whole set of colours to our own preference without disturbing the harmonious look of the original design. And that's a really sophisticated skill to learn, actually. So as many of you know, Marie is one of my all-time favourite designers, so we decided to count how many Marie Wallen designs have actually been knitted in this household, and we were quite surprised at the result. So Madeline and I are also including a Marie Wallen fashion show, which we've filmed for you here in our local Offenbach woods. So on top of that, we have some extreme knitting in the Girraween National Park, which is in northern New South Wales. So I filmed this when I was still in Australia and you're going to get to catch up with the lovely bush fairies Simba and Leia again. And then of course we've got some updates on our own knitting projects. That's right. A little bit of chat and some news. So I think we've definitely got to start with Madeline since the audience hasn't seen you for four months. I know, it's been such a long time. Well, while mum was in Australia, I had several exams and assignments to do for university. And I actually sent off my bachelor thesis a few weeks ago and it has been such a great relief to have that over and done with. I still have two exams coming up, but basically I'm free to work with mum now on Fruity Knitting, which I'm very excited about. Yes, and I'm very relieved about. Yeah. <laughs> so during the past four months, I've hardly knitted at all. But since mum's come back, I've picked up my old knitting project again. You last saw it in episode 117, so here's a picture to remind you of what this project looks like. The design is called Modest, and the pattern is in Kim Hargrave's book Pale from 2018. It's a very fitted crop jumper that is covered with beautiful twisted stitches, cables, and bobbles. As the name suggests, all the designs in that book are knitted in very light, neutral colours, but I went for this gorgeous dark turquoise yarn instead. This is the Devonia 4-ply by John Arben, and the colour is called Ocean Rain. Isn't that gorgeous? <laughs> So unlike the recommended yarn, which would be 100% super fine merino, this is a blend of long wools with less crimp. So super fine merino has a lot of crimp. So that means that this yarn is less rounded and that makes it less um, yeah, useful for cable knitting, basically. It doesn't the cables don't pop out more as much. Yeah, so, so a crimpy yarn like the merino is going to keep its memory and it's going to be bouncy. Yeah. Whereas a long, um, a long wool would be more drapey. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So to compensate for this, because I really do love this yarn, I just went down a needle size and that makes the fabric denser and the cables pop out a little more. But effectively, I'm shrinking my jumper now, so I need to add some extra stitches to the width so I still fit into it. Um, and this was very easy to do on this design because I could simply add some extra width to the moss stitch here on both sides instead of having to change the cable pattern. 
So we're working around the problem of using the wrong yarn for the wrong pattern. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> but since she loves this yarn so much, we're trying to make it work. <laughs> and it does look really miniature, and Madeline isn't miniature. You're pretty slim, but you're not miniature at 180 centimetres. <laughs> but, but it is going to have negative E, so pull it out so people don't get too worried. I'm not 180, uh, am I? Yes, you're 180 centimetres. Right, that's one, yep. <laughs> um, one... 180 yeah. meters. Anyway, I, I interrupted you. So we have added extra moss stitch on the side to give it extra width, and that way she yeah. doesn't have to rework all the gauge of the of the yeah. cables. But as you can see, it does have a lot of stretch. So it's actually got a, a slight bit of negative ease, and when I wear it, it's going to be a very fitted jumper, even though I've add, added extra width here. It'll look great on you. Yeah. Well, as Mum said, I'm completely enamored by the combination of this yarn and this design. Um, yeah, so let me show you a close-up picture of the cables next. The front and back pieces are the same. You start with 12 centimeters of fancy ribbing. This is a 2x2 two two rib with several fine columns of twisted stitches in between, and these twisted stitch columns travel up into the main pattern and right up into the neckline. The main pattern also has several horseshoe cables, all in different sizes. A horseshoe cable is made up of two mirrored columns placed next to each other, I'm doing most of the cables without a cable needle because it's so much faster, but the largest cable here has five stitches twisting over five stitches for each column, and that is easier to do with a cable needle. There is also a row of bubbles running down the center of the largest cables. One of the reasons I didn't knit much while mum was away, apart from having a lot of homework to do for uni, was that when I did pick up my knitting again, I didn't really remember where I was at in the pattern. I also couldn't quite understand my notes, and most of all, I had forgotten how to do the bobbles and the cables. <laughs> so it all felt like so much effort just to get started again, and I kept procrastinating. You might remember, actually, in one of the last episodes, Fiona writing to Madeline and asking her to put her psychology studies into good use and help mm -hmm. diagnose Fiona's <laughs> mental health due to her knitting. Well, that kind of gave me the idea that maybe we could start a new segment where Madeline chats about some of the theories she's learnt in psychology and we can see how they relate to us as knitters. That's right. And I came up with a good one that relates to me procrastinating on my knitting. Super. <laughs> it's called the Tsayaganik effect and it describes how we're better at remembering unfinished tasks or unsolved problems compared to tasks we've already completed. It was discovered 100 years ago by the Soviet psychiatrist Bluma Zyganik, so that's why it's called the Zyganik effect. And she found that our subconscious mind can differentiate between finished and unfinished tasks, and then it pushes those unfinished tasks into the forefront of our conscious mind. So our subconscious mind is continuously poking our conscious mind, trying to remind it to complete those tasks. And that sort of got me thinking, the subconscious mind sort of reminds me of a mother and the conscious mind of a naughty school kid. So okay. the, yeah, the mother's constantly walking into the room saying, have you done your homework yet? And the school kid, so the conscious mind, might roll its eyes and try to get the mum out of the room again as quick as possible so it can go back to reading a book instead of doing homework. Very familiar. <laughs> yeah. But even if the mum's out of the room again, it'll still have this underlying sense of stress or nervousness because it knows that homework needs to be done. And psychologists call this a state of mental discomfort. It can cause you to feel anxious or find it hard to concentrate. But this doesn't just happen with tasks that you know are good for you to do, like homework. We all know that urge to check our messages when we hear that notification go off on our phone. Even if we're you know, doing really productive work at the time, yeah. to our brains, reading that message becomes yet another task that it needs to do as quick as possible. And if we actively choose not to read the message, we might still find it hard to concentrate on the task at hand. So, I hope you can see where I'm going with this, because the psychonic effect can rear its ugly head in our sacred knitting and crafting space <laughs> as well. We certainly don't want that. So, mm. quick, what are the solutions? Well, no, I'll give you some examples first okay. so you understand okay. properly. So, if you're knitting happily away on your favourite project and you just really want to relax, you know, but then you start reminding or remembering all of these jobs you still need to do around yeah, the house. Okay. Or if you're starting a brand new project 
and you know you want to enjoy that beautiful yarn and the gorgeous design but your mind start feeding you images of these unfinished projects that you've put in the bag over there in the corner i think a lot of you can relate to that yeah <laughs> but these are both examples of the zygonic effect not letting your mind rest and this can be very detrimental to a knitter's mental health okay so what do we what do we have to do about it the solutions well let me first say that when the zygonic effect was first discovered, yeah. they thought the only way to resolve this mental tension was to, you know, give your complete the task yeah. that you had once started but not finished. But more recently they found that what our subconscious really wants is for our conscious mind, so for us, to acknowledge those unfinished tasks and then to make a plan as to how we will finish them in the future. Once the unfinished tasks have been, you know, put up into a little plan. Sorted, yeah. That's right, sorted. Our conscious mind feels that it's done its job and it can just sit back and relax. Oh, that'd be nice. I know. Okay, so. Yeah. Okay, so here's some, some examples. If you um, are in the middle of knitting and you start remembering those jobs that you need to get done, take a second to write them down on a piece of paper. <laughs> Isn't that innovative? <laughs> is that For what that, this is? Yes, you will need a special zygonic effect notebook <laughs> you need to carry this around in your project bags at all times for emergencies okay. so you write down your jobs and then you can't forget them and your brain won't be so stressed very and good you can go back to knitting or if you're working on a new you know a new uh, project sorry but your mind keeps confronting you with those unfinished tasks unfinished projects mm -hmm. then you might just want to look at each project individually and think is the end result really worth the effort of investing and completing it and if it isn't maybe just be done with it you know unravel the yarn and give it away to a friend okay so make a plan for them make a plan for each unfinished project that's right make a plan as to how to finish it or be done with it because that way it's also no longer an open task that your brain needs to remind you of all the time Okay, very good. Now, yeah. how does it relate to you with procrastination? Okay, so here comes the interesting part. It's not always a negative thing, the zygonic effect. You can actually use it to your advantage. So this is what I should have done. You just say to yourself, I'm going to work on this project for 10 minutes and then I can stop. So that gets you started without feeling that awful pressure of going on after 10 minutes have passed by. But because of the zygonic effect we tend to want to complete a task once we have started it. So in that way, the zygonic effect might have led me or you to continue for just another 10 or 20 minutes afterwards. And you might even end up finishing that or solving that problem in the very same okay, session. Okay, so the zygonic effect can help us with our discipline in a way. So if we've yeah. got a problem and we, it just feels really hard to get over that initial inertia, yeah. if you tell yourself, I'll only do it for 10 minutes, then you've, you've, you know you can stop after 10 minutes. That's right. But the problem is that because we've already started and it's an unfinished task... We have this innate urge to keep going. To keep going. And <laughs> so the psychonic effect might make us go longer and then we've probably finished the task. Oh, isn't that brilliant? That yeah. sounds great. <laughs> well, I can actually relate to the psychonic effect because I have just started a brand new project despite having two unfinished garments on the go already. So... The first one is this primrose, which I've been talking about and showing to you in the last couple of episodes. That's Beautiful. unfinished. And then I have my uh, my boa stickning design, the wild apples, which is still unfinished. So I have done exactly what you said. I've made a plan for both of these garments, and now I'm completely mentally stressed free. <laughs> Mental <laughs> stress free. <laughs> stress <mentally>. free. <laughs> So I really wanted to start on my new project because it's the perfect garment to wear from late spring to early autumn. Here it is here. And I really have to get cracking on it if I want to get lots of wear out of it this season. So let me tell you about the plans that I've made. This primrose is proving to be a little bit problematic at the moment. I've undone it and reworked different sections of it a couple of times already, and I'm still not quite happy with the fit. So it's really going to benefit from me putting it aside for a little bit and then coming back with fresh eyes and a happy heart. And I'm sure I'll be able to figure out what's wrong with it and, and make it into something really good. It is stunning colours, isn't it? So that's it's the plan beautiful. for this one. And I'm not going to be able to wear this to late autumn anyway because it's quite a thick, cosy jumper. And then with the boa stickning, let me just show you again this beautiful yoke. 
It's absolutely stunning. All the difficulty in this design is in the yoke itself, and I've done that. So all I have to do now is many, many hours of monotonous stocking stitch at a very fine gauge. But I think this is, my plan for this one is that we take it with us on our trip to the UK. Oh, right, yep. Because it's the perfect project to pick up and drop down at a moment's notice, day or night, without having to think about where I am in the pattern. So there we go. Two perfect plans, thanks to my recent understanding of the Zygonic effect. Well done, Mum. <laughs> well done, you. <laughs> so that means I am all sorted, done and dusted, home and hosed, and I have no mental stress. So I'll quickly tell you about this project. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about it because we've got a, a really full program this episode anyway. But it's such an exciting design, so I want to show you a picture of how it's going to look when it's finished. So it's called the Corbus Sweater and it's by Natasha Hornby. It's such an interesting construction because you knit it from the top down and partially on the bias and it starts with a basket weave yoke that then morphs into a twisted stitch pattern with a diamond shape and lots of bobbles and then it morphs back into the basket weave pattern before turning into stockingette. So I've finished all the fancy patterning and I'm on to the stocking stitch. Here it is here. I've decided to put it on and show you. This is the first time I've actually put it on. So it's kind of weird. We've got this um, diamond shape at the front and the back that is all of the, the patterning. And then what you do is you fill in all the missing bits on the jumper with stocking stitch and you do that with uh, short rows. So I've started down here. So I've probably done two thirds of it in all because it's going to be sort of stood in the waist here. It's looking very fitted. Yeah. Well, yeah. I actually want mine fitted. Yeah, no, it looks good. I actually good. wondered whether I would go down a size in in um, the stocking stitch, but I don't think I need to Okay. at all. Yeah, so it's very, it's quite fascinating. And I'll tell you all the details in the next episode. Now, many of you have enjoyed seeing my little nieces and Madeline's cousins, Simba and Leia, doing their crafting in various locations, showing off the Australian bush and beaches. Well, I'm very happy to take you into the bush again, the Australian bush again, for some more extreme knitting with Simba and Leia, and this time into the Girraween National Park, which is in northern New South Wales. So Girraween is an indigenous word meaning place of flowers, and in springtime this national park is filled with beautiful wild native flowers. I filmed this in late summer, so unfortunately there aren't any flowers, but it still is a completely stunning landscape with massive granite outcrops and balancing boulders and clear running streams. And the bush fairies are pretty cute as well. Sounds very romantic. <laughs> it is. <laughs> and in an Australian way, it's kind of dry and grey green. Mm. And and I also took out the drone, so you've got some really good aerial footage of the whole National Park. So I hope you enjoy that, and we'll see you soon on the other side.
So welcome back. Have a look at this big pile of garments we've got in between us. So I decided to count how many Marie Wallen designs I've actually knitted. And the number was eight, eight finished garments. Isn't that incredible? Well, you've <laughs> knitted most of them. Yes, <laughs> most of them. And I'm working on my ninth. So this is this. I don't know if this is something to be proud of or to be embarrassed about. I think it's incredible. I mean, these are only Marie Wallen jumpers. You have to think you've got all these other designers. Shh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so since we are featuring Marie Wallen, it's the perfect timing to bring them out and show them to you. And I'm sure you're going to recognize all of them. You will have seen me either working on them, doing a tutorial on them or wearing them in one of the last 121 episodes. So I can't quite remember the order that I knitted them in, but I'm going to try to show you chronologically. The very first one is the Lovage, so you can be my assistant. And this is a really beautiful design that I knitted for Madeline. It comes from Marie's very first collection called Wind Swept, which was uh, published in 2014. I didn't do any modifications on this design. I didn't even do any short row shaping to raise the back of the neck. I just left it exactly how it was and it fits Madeline beautifully. Yeah. And it's made out of the Rowan Fine Tweed, which is now discontinued. You can hold it for me again. But it is the most gorgeous yarn. It's a crying shame they discontinued it. I've knitted two garments in this design. This one and one for Andrew. And despite hundreds of hours of wear and lots of rubbing with backpacks, there's not a single peel. So it's, mm. I'm really, really sad that this yarn has been discontinued. But anyway, it's beautiful. I, I'd have to say it's probably one of my favorite. <laughs> Madeline says that if, if she... Mum's been eyeing it. Yeah, and she says that she'll give it to me if I give her this one. That's a really hard choice. Well, you have to trade. <laughs> anyway, so that's the love itch. Next up is the Amaryllis. So if you hold that for mm -hmm. me. The Amaryllis is a gorgeous, elegant cardigan, cropped cardigan with um, three-quarter length sleeves. And hold it with both hands for me. And it comes from this book here, this collection called The Springtime. And I've knitted quite a few designs, or three designs, from this book. I love this book. It's got a real good variety of, of styles in it. So... This design was inspired by um, Eastern European folk and, uh, embroideries. Yes, I was going to say tapestries. You hold it up on that, yes. that corner. As you can see clearly with this section here, I absolutely adore this design. It's probably my favourite. It's so elegant. So I knitted this one for me. And it's knitted in the Rowan felted tweed, and I use the colours clay and avocado. And I actually did two, uh, three tutorials on this one. Because you knit it flat, it means that you're also purling uh, Fair Isle as well. So I show you how to catch the floats on the purl side, and then of course the more usual way of how to catch the floats on the knit side. But then also I did a tutorial on how to combine Fair Isle and Intarsia together. So I've opened it up and you can see on the inside that it's, it's been done in pieces and it's looking really neat on the inside. And the entire combination of Intarsia and Fair Isle is this section here. So I haven't taken the green yarn to, right to the seams. I've only sort of gone back and forward where the motive is, and that's the combination of Fair Isle and Intarsia. But this is a totally stunning design. It's okay. very elegant. That's that one. On to the next. The next one is <laughs> called Blossom. This is also from the Springtime Collection, and this one is in a class of its own. It is such a unique design, and it's got incredibly intricate Intarsia here. So many colours in this rose. I'm actually going to quickly turn it inside out so that you can see how it's been constructed. So this one is done in the round. I won't turn the arms out, but if we hold it like this. This is done in the round and bottom up done in the round. And it took me quite a while to figure out how to best do these intarsia roses. So what, because the problem is that when you, you're knitting in the round, just say you come here on, your, on this side of the rose, you've got your colored threads and then you work them across and then you drop them down here, continue knitting 
all the way around and then when you come to this side again the colored threads that you want to use are hanging down on this side of the road so you've got two options you could loop them right across the rows so that they're here where you want them but then you've got a great long float and that can pull or else you can chop them off and add it and start with new colors but then you've got thousands of, of um, ends to weave in and the roses will end up being pretty padded so what I did in the end was I knitted it in the round up to here and then I put a seam in the back and I knitted the whole yoke of the with the uh, roses back and forward so knitting and purling and knitting and purling and then when I finished the roses I joined it together again and continued knitting it in the in the round and then I sewed up the seam at the back so there it is there and I also did a tutorial on that whole process of, of doing the intarsia with a seam up the back. That's good because it sounds a little bit complicated. And by the way, all the tutorials that I've done are available on our Patreon site for all our patrons in an archive for them to watch whenever they want to. Because even if you're not doing these designs, sort of the concepts, I'm sure you'll be able to apply to any design that you're working on. Yep, you'll be able to find them the quickest way if you go onto fruityknitting.com. That's our blog, and on the left side there'll be a straight link that'll take you directly to the Patreon page. Or an index too, so that you can find these. That's true, yeah. Yeah, if you look yeah. for the index of, of the tutorials, then you can find all the different tutorials. Cool. Yeah. The next one is Daffodil. So you hold that for me. It's also... Yeah, that's great. Just hold it by both shoulders. <laughs> It's also from the springtime collection. So you can see while I'm raving about this book because those last three designs are so completely different. The only thing that is sort of uniting them is that they're feminine and very, very beautiful. So you could imagine it's possible that the same designer did them all, but they're completely different styles. And this book mm. is filled with that. It's, it's just such a great book. Anyway, <laughs> this one is done with the Hampshire four ply by the Grey Sheep Company and I was actually with Marie when I was at the Edinburgh Yarn Festival when I was choosing the yarn for this design and I couldn't decide between two colours and she convinced me to go with this colour which is called Dancing with Olives and I'm so glad I did because I love it. It's gorgeous and the yarn smells really sheepy. Yeah so it's mm -hmm. a lovely combination of lace, uh, twisted stitches, hold, hold, hold it up again, and cables and the the cables and the twisted stitches go right down to the hem yeah so it's very very beautiful and i also love the wide crew neck at the top that sits really beautifully on the neckline mm. okay and then we have this design which is called norbu and this um, marie did this one for or designed this one for the rowan soft yak collection which came out soft yak dk collection which came out in 2016 and in the magazine the model who was wearing this design was an audrey hepburn look-alike mm -hmm. which really sold me on the design because it just looks so classically 50s so it's quite cropped it's got three quarter length sleeves with some twisted stitch cabling detail and it just looks stunning with dresses and skirts so I wear this a lot in summertime yeah, yeah you do okay getting through the, the garments and then we've got the sumfrey so you hold that one up and this one comes from Marie's Shetland collection here which I think came out in 2017 and it's knitted in the ja Jamiesons of Shetland Spindrift yarn which is a fantastic yarn for feral there's hundreds of colors they're all beautifully heathered and they just sort of can be all melted in together so I think this design was one of the, the I think it was the most difficult one in the whole collection and, and the reason for that is that the pattern repeats were very long and very difficult to memorize but apart from that it was pretty easy to knit and I can't remember whether the pattern said to do it in the round or to do it flat but I knitted it in the round and then for the armholes, I steeped the armholes, and then you'll notice here if you if you just drop it a minute, and if you can see that, there's some shaping in ferrule on the shoulder seams there. So normally, what I would do, is, you can hold it back again. <laughs> Got an important job here, people. <laughs> you do. Is once I'd knitted it up to the top of the steeks, 
I would then separate the front from the back and work in, in the flat, so knitting and purling ferrule so I could get that shaping, final shaping on the shoulders. But for this design, I did another technique where I kept working in the round and I did the shaping with short rows. It's a really fascinating technique and I did a tutorial on that one as well, showing you the whole process. So that's the Sumfrey. And then we have the Sky, which comes from the North Sea collection. So this is a really beautiful design and I've actually done short row shaping on this one to raise the back of the neck. You can see that there, there's more on the back of the neck than there is on the front of the neck. And this has a really complicated twisted stitch pattern all over the body, but then to calm everything down, it's just got a very simple uh, pattern on the yoke. So I think it's a very balanced design. And I knitted this one also in the Hampshire four ply by the Grey Sheep Company. And I don't know, there's something about this design that just is so wearable and so everyday comfort, um, <laughs> comfortable because I went through a stage of wearing it absolutely every day and I would go out and I'd meet the same people and I would be still wearing the same jumper. It was kind of embarrassing, but the next morning I was still compelled to reach for this jumper and wear it because it just, I don't know, it, maybe it's the sheepiness or something, but it's a combination that I just want to wear it all the time. It's well, a bit it embarrassing. Also, yeah, but it also looks like you put a lot of effort into it with all these I, cables. Well, so. there's a lot of effort in all of them. That's true. But anyway, I wore it so much that I wore out a hole in my elbow and um, I'm so proud of this because <laughs> I was actually at the cancer clinic with Andrew when I was repairing this and I really wanted it to be an invisible mend, not a visible mend, because it's busy already and I just wanted to keep the harmony of the design. I had some wool, but I didn't have my pattern with me. So what I did, and you can't see it at all, so I'm so proud, <laughs> I picked up stitches below the hole and then reading the pattern from the body, I figured out how the pattern went and I knitted up over the hole and I included the side stitches in it because I didn't want to have sort of open seams that I would have to sew down on the side so it would look like a patch. And then when I got to the top, I grafted it with stitches from above. And it's so good that I can't, if I might say so myself, <laughs> that I found it really hard to find it. I just know it's on my left elbow. So look at that. And I did a tutorial on that one as well. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah, I was really proud of that. Okay, so there we go. Now we're up to the we're one up to you the did. the one that I knitted. So tell us about it. Yes, well, this is the Bresser. It's also from Marie Wallen's Shetland collection, and it also uses the Jameson's of Shetland Spindrift yarn. And this is my first complicated ferrule. It's probably the hardest design I've actually knitted so far. And the what's the stitch count? It's 29 well, stitches to 31 rows I yeah. believe so it's quite fine and it but took on me the, ages on the sticking, the stotch, the that's right on the stocking <laughs> stitch <laughs> the stocking stitch yeah <laughs> the yeah. sticking stotch was very fine gauge <laughs> yeah but, but I, I really enjoyed it yeah I put yeah. So, uh, I got you to put um short rows on the back on neck. the back as well yeah so you yeah. can see that very clearly it's a lot higher and it fits very well it's one of my favorite designs yeah, my favorite great. jumpers. And so just to complete the whole story, this is the ninth garment with its very beautiful coloring. So wow, that's that's pretty impressive, isn't it? Yeah. So many Marie Wallen designs. Now they look, it's much better to see them being modeled than just held up. So Madeline and I took the whole collection to our Offenbach Woods, which is just in the neighborhood, and we filmed a fashion show for you. But before we go there, Marie Wallen is offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 50% discount of all her self-published patterns in her Ravelry store. And Marie has published most of her designs in books, but over time she releases individual patterns so that they can be bought separately as well. And I counted at least 150 individual knitting and crochet designs, which you can buy as single patterns from her Ravelry store, including five out of the eight designs that I've just showed you. So I think that's a really amazing offer.
So last year, Madeline and I spent a month traveling around the UK interviewing various different people for the show. And some of the interviews that we did during that trip were the K Facet interviews, Crochet Dermy, so that's the life-sized realistic animal sculptures that are done in crochet. There was also Alan Dart, the toy designer, and Illusion Knitting. If you haven't seen Illusion Knitting, you've got to go and see, go back and watch that interview. It shows you the extreme end of what you can do with knitting, and it's absolutely beautiful. And then there was also Sarah Hatton, who many of you enjoyed in the last episode. And of course, we have today's interview with Marie Wallen. So that were some of the interviews that we did last trip. We have actually run out of content and we need to go and create some more content. Mm. So Madeline and I have planned another trip to the UK in June which we're quite excited about. Yes. Now, although these trips do sound like a lot of fun, and they are, they're also a tremendous amount of work and preparation goes into them. So we're driving around all different places. Typically what happens when I interview somebody is I spend quite a few hours just finding the person in the first place and then researching all about them and then pre preparing questions and then working together with the guest so that we can get some content that's really condensed, like all of everything that they know, sort of condensed in a shortest possible time frame so that it's really good viewing for you. And that doesn't happen magically. That takes quite a lot of work yeah. behind the scenes. Yeah. And then when we actually come to do the interview, of course, we, we go to them. It takes an hour to set up all the equipment we're probably filming for a couple of hours another hour to pack up the equipment then we drive home and then we start backing up all this precious footage so we never lose it that's so important and then recharging all of the batteries for the cameras and the audio and the lights and da 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 <laughs> you get the picture then this footage stays in our dropbox which has got umpteen terabytes of storage and until I'm ready to use it. And then when I'm ready to use it, I would spend a minimum of 15 hours, probably 20 or 25 hours, editing that interview so that it's really smooth for you. And Madeline works on the audio, so the audio is a pleasant experience and you don't have to get, turn up and down your volume all the time. So there is a ton of work that goes behind the scenes. The two points I'm coming to is, first of all, because we will be doing a lot of work like this, and it is quite stressy, I find it sometimes quite stressy, mm. we won't have time to put out a full episode for you in the month of June. But what we will do is another travel vlog. So we'll try to keep you updated as to where we are. We might give you some spoilers of who we're interviewing and some behind the scenes footage and some of the places we might be driving through. So hopefully you'll enjoy that as a little bit of a change and then we'll be back to full episodes again in July. And the second point is that it is our full-time job. So Madeline is now joining me full-time. I've been trying to keep Fruity Knitting going during the last year pretty much just me and little bits of work from Fia, from Madeline. Madeline. But um, a lot of things have sort of kind of slipped behind behind the scenes because there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes. So I'm super pleased to have her once she's done these two exams, which she's going to be doing, by the way, While on we're travelling in a hotel. I know, which is really stressful as well. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm glad that they're online. Yeah, so I'm very glad when that'll be finished and then she'll, she'll be able to help me do some more things and, and bring what's fallen behind yeah. back up on on the page anyway the show is only possible through patreons and only a single a low single digit percentage of our viewers have become patrons so we do really need your support to become patrons and keep the show going and we choose the patron model because we don't have advertising on the show any advertising that you might get we're on YouTube is not put on there by us and we're not earning revenue from it. The revenue will go to the musicians for the music that we're putting on because the, the music that we put on we feel is a very valuable part of the show. So I just want to reiterate that. So we're not getting any money from advertising at all. So Patreon support is extremely important to us. So you can pick a level that suits your income and it is very flexible. So Please do that and thank you so much. We are very, very grateful to all of the wonderful patrons who have supported the show so far. Yeah, thank you very much. And also thank you for spending time with us this episode. Coming up now is the interview with Marie Wallen. Yes, we're very excited about it. You'll see just 
some lovely, gorgeous garments coming up you'll get very excited about. And we will see you soon, but not in this location. Okay, bye. bye. Knitting. Today I'm in the Midlands of England near the market town of Melton Mowbray and with me is the very well-known designer Marie Wallen. <laughs> Marie is one of my all-time favourite designers and she's graciously been on Fruity Knitting a couple of times already <laughs> so it's really terrific to have her on again. So for 11 years Marie was the head designer of Rowan and since leaving Rowan she has her own design company where she produces books and kits and creative workshops and very importantly, her beautiful British breed yarn range here, which supports her patterns. And during the lockdown, Marie's been very busy designing wonderful new collections, and we're going to have a look at some of those designs today. So thank you so much for inviting me into your home. Oh, well, you're very welcome. It's always <laughs> a pleasure to have you and Madeline here. So Good. It's great. Good. Okay, so let's begin by talking about your yarns, and they're spun by John Arben, and John has been on Fruity Knitting fairly recently, and in his interview he's spoken a lot of detail about how they were spun. So maybe today just give us a quick recap on what fleeces are used, and then can you talk in more detail about how you've developed the colour palette over yeah. the years? No, that's fine. Well, British Breeds was, we took two years in the making, um, we had one experimental yarn beforehand, which was actually had British alpaca in it. Um, that didn't work. Um, I mean, it was a beautiful yarn, undyed, but as soon as we dyed it, it just um, lost its spring and life and everything. So we developed British breed as it is now because we decided to change the British alpaca and put swarbles in it, which was um, a bit of a revelation for me. I mean, it was John that suggested it. Um, and that adds the springiness and bounce to the actual yarn. So it's made up of four different breeds. It's made up of uh, Blueface Leicester, Devon Exmoor, Wensleydale, and then the Swarbles. And it's the Swarbles that's undyed in it. So it gives that lovely sheepy smell. It does. So I'm wearing one of the designs and I could smell it as soon as I yeah. put it on. It's lovely. <laughs> Yeah, so um, hopefully everyone likes that smell. It was one of the criteria that I wanted when I developed the yarn, that it had to still retain some of that sheepy smell in there. So the yarn is fibre dyed. It's not yarn dyed. So what that means is the colours are blended together. So John dyes the yarn into different different sort of lots of colour and then he uses a recipe to create each of these colours Um and then they're blended together and then the swarbles is added after that because with that being undyed that gives that sort of melange type look to it really so that's the actual yarn in a very very quick recap yeah and talk. it's four ply isn't it it is a four ply it's worsted spun it's not woolen spun um the reasons why i wanted it worsted spun as well was because worsted spun creates a softer more durable stronger yarn as well so that was the main reason for that because a lot of sort of colored yarn for feral tends to be woolen spun so um but i decided to go down the worsted spun and john obviously he's not a woolen spun spinner he's a worsted spinner yeah so. and the gauge knits knits up to 
What kind of gauge? Um, it's not a standard UK four ply. It's just sli- slightly different. I mean, on Fair Isle, I'm sort of um, 28 stitches and 29 rows. Mm-hmm. Um, and stocking stitch, it's 26 stitches and 34 rows. Yeah. So it's slightly, it's not a true classic four ply, but it's in that realms. And obviously I knit it as a standard four ply. So when um, you've so. only got 12 colours... Mm. How did you decide which ones would be in the brownie and, and how many greens well, or how many blues? Well, because, because I designed Farrell and invariably you need a big colour palette, I needed to choose, I suppose the initial 12 were the hardest to, mm. to form really because I needed, I needed colours within sort of different groups. So we've got sort of paler colours here and then you've got sort of the paler colours here and then you've got like the mid-tones here around here and then obviously you need some darks as well so I, I was very conscious that each of the colors had to work together when they're knitted together in a furrow pattern but also that that they individually on their own if you wanted to knit a solid color garment then they are just lovely got lovely beautiful colors, colors in themselves. To, yeah, yeah in themselves so but the main thing is that they they work well together in pattern and I think when you look at other yarns available in in different color palettes um invariably might a yarn might have a big color palette but it's sometimes very difficult to still put colors together that work together in a in a pattern because they've got to work in a certain way tonally um, so how do yours how would you describe that with yours what what's the underlying sort of uniting well they're all sort of Tonal colours, if you if you like, because tonality is where you add grey into into a colour, um, so and that gives it that sort of softness mm-hmm. in it. So even the dark colours are not sort of very saturated dark. So um, because the swarbles is undyed, that gives that element to it. Swarbles is sort of a grey brown fibre. I don't put colours together that are really contrasting. So I tend to put colours together which are tonally contrasting, if you like. Mm-hmm. Um, so the so the overall visual effect is soft, it's still is soft. harmonious. Yes, yeah. and it and it's and it's quite soft. So it was a case of picking colours that you know that I knew sort of those two would work together, but also that would work well with that. You know they, that they all work. That, yeah, that's, that's beautiful. You know, so mm-hmm. in all directions they all sort of like work together um so we initially started with 12 then i added another four so gradually as you add colors you look you go sort of go you, back you see the gaps and yes. you see the gaps yeah. and you fill them in yeah. and you think okay i need a more yeah. neutral or i need a brighter mid yeah. tone or a brighter yeah. darker or okay. yeah 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 um so obviously i put a very soft heathery heavy tone in there and then the corn cockle which is sort of like um a lavender, a lavender dem in blue, really, in a way. And then I wanted um, a darker, more saturated dark green to sort of go in the, the end of, you know, with mulberry, that sort mm-hmm. of level. And then dahlia, um, I just want, I mean, this sort of level of colour, the the rust, the autumn colours are my favourites anyway, mm-hmm. um, sort of the autumn colours going into the green. Um, and I just wanted a stronger, rusty sort of, orangey and I love dahlia I think it's really nice color okay so all together there's how many 24 so there'll be the the current range is 20 and it's now going to be 26 next 26. in 22 okay yeah. great. so the, the six new colors will launch on the 1st of March next year well I know that our viewers would also really love to see how you put together color palettes for your beautiful fair art designs yeah so could you, I know that you like to start with the patterns first and then you add the colour, mm. that's your process. Yeah. So maybe you could show us your process by using one of your current designs as an example. Right, well I can show, um, demonstrate how to do that with the latest design for the Farewell Club here. So this is Farewell Club uh, 7, which is called the Kaleem Cardigan, basically because the inspiration behind each of the pattern sections were from carpets from um eastern the far east from india from um china from iran iraq um i've got a big interest in in rugs and carpets and things so it was a natural progression for me to sort of design something based on on that those sort of patterning here 
as, as you probably know, I put I use a lot of colours together in in my designs, and but I also mix a lot of patterns together as well. So in the Fair Isle Club, um, it gives me the opportunity to sort of to go to town a little bit more than what I do in my standard designs. So um, I've got um, six different sections here, so six different patterns, um, and it uses a total of eighteen colours altogether. I get this question asked a lot how I actually design and it's a very difficult question to answer um, because initially I have an idea in my head so visually I see things in my head in my mind's eye if you like and then it's the case of getting that in my knitting and then and then down so so you see the finished back, pattern and the colours? I do yeah. tend to okay. yeah and then and that might, might be a little bit unusual I don't know but that's how I, I do it and I start off so I always start off with I think for a, a garment that uses a lot of pattern and a lot of color it's important that you start off with a, a border type um, pattern and that's what that is there so if you look at any of my old um, farewell clubs they've all got this start, start off of, of the border here so um which so one was the border pattern here? So that was my original um, design swatch, okay. for, uh, design graph, if you like, for this here. Now, I don't, I might have a little bit of graph paper where I just scroll, you know, scribble down some actual shapes, but I then formulate it into here. And I just do a black and white pen drawing like you can see here. And then I used to colour them in. And with the colours, but now because I've got so many colours anyway, and I'm very familiar with how the colours work together, I just literally divide the design up into se into sections, um, and then you know I then sort of assign colours to it, and then from there I actually then start to knit my design swatch. Now this is my design swatch for the whole garment here, so um, so I would start here. Now sometimes I do change colour as I go along and um, because my, if I've written something down I thought oh no that doesn't quite right I would change it there but also as well invariably what happens is that I'll knit the whole thing so the whole of that and I would look at it and if any any section of it I'm not happy with the actual visual look of the um of the actual design I would swiss down the colour over the top until it's balanced okay so just let's take this pattern as an example in your head, when you mm. first imagined it, did you think, okay, so I'm going to use, did you start off with this and you say you want a fairly light border? Well, it, yeah. I mean, I wanted the main section to have a dark mm -hmm. background. Um, so the this simple pattern at either, either end is, is just, ju borders, it's it. just yeah. borders it. And then the main pattern, which is this one here, which is from there, um, here is actually very simple design really it's it's I think it's I think it's an 18 stitch repeat in total um, and it's quite easy to to follow uh, once you've got the initial design in your head um, so and it was a case of then because um, I've done dark background there I would could do light background here mm -hmm. so that's how a design if you're mixing pattern together and color together it's important that you you know, change, change that, change that. Yeah. so like if you've got a pattern with a dark background then you border it with a pattern with a light background and then that in that way you create that, that difference yeah. yeah differentiation between between the two really okay um, now your your background colors if we just look at the background mm. colors they are all melting sort of into each other they yeah. change gradually and then your motive colors are also melting in. yeah and you've have you used less colors on the motive or not no no not no, really no same. yeah okay so the same same amount it's just that because i've got i've got a lot of colors now in mm -hmm. the palette a lot of them are quite close so when they're they're knitted closely together they they, they look very more painterly blending. yeah yeah and I, I deliberately wanted to make the clean cardigan slightly bluer as well so that's why i've put more of the um so the odineal and the corn cockle and the and then the mallard which is that is the rib colour, you know, makes it more predominantly blue, really. If you do want to have a go at mixing patterns together, but it's not just in 
knitting but pattern in any form so if you're putting pattern fabric together I think it's in you can mix and match patterns but they they've all got to have a, this, a similar or tonal sort of colour um, balance throughout for them to work together so you know even if you're designing fabrics for you and if you wanted to put cushions and curtains together in your interiors then it's the same sort of thing so you can you can mix completely different patterns together but but they've got to be of the same sort of tone same sort of color range if you like for Mm. them to work together yeah okay that's great so how many patterns in total in this garment so so there's six in in this so we've got the border so i started with the border then i did the main one here and then i wanted instead of x Standing, this was a decision as I went along actually instead of descending the whole of that that pattern along to the edge of the sleeve because it's a, a dolman sleeve um, I wanted to break it up so I broke it up with more of a geometric pattern because that's quite um how would I describe it? it's it's a softer pattern yes yeah, there's not, more circles in it isn't yeah it? it's more broken up and then I was so I wanted a more sort of graphic pattern more solid here you're alternating you're lots al- of things, yes. alternating background and foreground. And also pattern, type of How, pattern. Type of pattern yeah. and direction of yeah. pattern too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then the last thing you do is add this um, sort of like more traditional sort of uh, carpet type pattern there, to, which is obviously the, the whole thing then is mirrored to create the whole front. Okay, that's very beautiful. Just mm. because I know everyone's going to ask, this is your latest Fair Isle Club design. Yes. That's Feral Club 7. When was it released or when will it be well, released? Well, the booking is was on the 1st of December. Okay. Um, and then the knit along starts on the 1st of February. Okay, great. That's absolutely beautiful. Now, what I know is that sometimes a knitter will see a design that they absolutely fall in love and love with and they really want to knit it, but they just want to change the whole set of colours mm. So it perhaps fits their their complexion better. So, Mm. for example, they could see a design that's in a warm palette that's using lots of beautiful golds and rich browns and and oranges even. They want to change it to Mm. something that's more blue or purpley. So what's your advice to them on how to do that? Well, so I get asked asked this question a lot, you know, how do I change colour? And it's a lot, you know, it is... It's experience at the end of the day, but there are basic things that I can say that you could change, help change. So a good example is Honeysuckle here, which is from Gentle. Um, I did a colour, a basic colour workshop, um, gosh, in 2019 before all the craziness of the pandemic. Um, so, and we, we use this as, as a subject to show you how to change colour. So um, we did, I did a two different colourways. So you can see here, um, so the basic rules are is is changing colour like for like, so tonally. So if you're um, changing, um, say that the silver birch that's there, you need to change it with a colour of similar of the same tonal strength. And what I mean by that is if you're looking at two colours together like for like, when you look at them, they have to be not one of them dominant. So um, they have to be. So when you look at them together, your eye isn't immediately drawn to another one, yeah. you know, either one or the other. So, so therefore, on, on this colourway here, I've, I've changed the silver birch to the um, pale oak and then changed the... Now, obviously, in this original colourway, it's quite strong because the raw creates a stronger contrast. But I've still, it's still light for light and I've swapped the raw for the blossom so, but because the blossom and the and the pale oak blend better together, it creates an overall softness. Okay, so there's a bit of license. Yeah, and yeah. then obviously the highlight color in this colorway is the quince, which is the gold, and then I've swapped it and put with the raw here. So you've got so you swap a highlight color for another highlight color, and vice versa. So it's the it's a case of, you know, just swapping like for like. Um, and this was another colourway, which also works as well. So again, I've sw- swapped the silver birch, so the raw for the silver birch and the O'Donnell for um, the silver birch on the original swatch. So again, the whole thing works and um, and the quince, so the raw is still the highlight colour on that. Um, now this swatch here was one I did to demonstrate 
on what not to do, basically. This section actually works quite well. Um, but if you actually look here, you're completely losing it. So you, mm. if you look here. So th this is what invariably happens is what I see. People like a colour. Mm -hmm. So, oh, I really want to make it blue. So they put a blue in into the actual um, design. But just because you like a colour doesn't mean it's going to work. So, um, it's you know, it's got to work together. And, and invariably, if you've got a section there, you might like the, the rest of it. But this section there, it ruins the bal overall balance. So if does. you look at that, it just doesn't work. From a distance, that yeah. just looks like a plain exactly. stripe. Yeah. Yeah. So, just very quickly on the spot. Yes. For instance, we've got our our very warm colours here, mm. um, and we've got more coolie colour blues here. Yeah. Maybe you could just say, for instance, this is, uh, you know, like their like for like, or yeah. The, what would you? Maybe you could put some. Yeah, I mean, like you've got, you know, silver birch, you could use corn cooker. It's, it, visually, they've got to be the same. So, um, so, you know, the same with that, really. So if you yeah. put, if you put, say, for, you put those two together, if you, you hold them out like that, the, your eye's not drawn to either one or the other. Yes. Yes. So you know if the, if if you've got a design that uses that, but you want to use that, you know it would work. Yes. But obviously you've got to change the contrast colour the same way as well. It's not straightforward, you yeah. know. Yeah. At the end of the day, you know, people do degrees in colour theory. So I mean, it's you know, it's not something that you can, you know, immediately do. Sweep, but it, so is it, you know, yeah. yeah, it's just literally a a quick way of doing it. Is is if you can look at the original colourway and dissect it and then pick colours which are like for like, mm -hmm. then you you know, you have to do a bit of work to do it. It's not just a case of, oh, I like that blue, I want to stick it yeah. in. But it's if I see a colourway that's just just not right, visually affects me. Yeah. You know, physically affects me. It's like if you hear a, a bum note if yes. you're a musician, yeah. it's sort of like, you know Out of tune. Yeah, yeah. and that's what colour does to me if it's if colours are jarring and it just doesn't work and if someone's put colours together in a certain way um, it might work but the overall balance of the design it's not just a case of swapping colour for colour you have to look at the whole design yes. as well so I always recommend if you are going to in change a colourway is to knit a design swatch with those colours yeah. in but knit the whole repeat because and then hold it up at arm's length and if it looks balanced, then fine, go ahead and knit your garment. If it, if it doesn't, and you you know it, it looks odd to you, then it, the whole gar if you went ahead and knitted the whole garment, the whole garment wouldn't work. So it's much better to do it in swatch yeah. form first, and then it, you then Swiss darn some colours over the top. You don't have to re knit it. Yeah, and maybe just go slowly. Just yeah. just change one or two colours first, yeah. Yeah. and then yeah, yeah. try it. Okay, now you have been working on two new collections. Yes. Cumbria and Westmoreland. Mm. And there's a total of 22 designs in both of these books and six, uh, that includes six garments for men, which I think is fantastic. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about designing for men. Do you have a different criteria or emphasis? And we also want to have a look at a couple of those designs. Right. Designing for men, I don't really treat it in any other different way really to women I suppose the color aspect is a little bit more different because obviously I tend not to use pinks and, and rose colors that type of thing but we've got one here um you'll have to excuse the mannequin because I haven't got a male mannequin so we've got <laughs> we've got breasts we've got a boob, <laughs> boob issue here um so this is Blancathra which will be either in Cumbria or Westmoreland I've not decided which designs are in in yet but obviously when I designed the men's wear range I wanted a, a design that blended all the way through I mean it does have a band which is more of a highlight band but because it runs through it the whole design it is balanced but you've got a blend of of colors going from the rusts into the greens into, into the blues there so I didn't really obviously with the men's wear I didn't want to use you know things like the blossom and the um, foxglove, that type of thing. Um, but really, the rest of the colours are colours that I use for women's wear as, as well. And then obviously the one over here, this is Glen Midding. Again, I don't know which book this is going to end up in. Um, but this is more of a 
more of a neutral blues, if you like. So it's blue with um, the silver birch and the, the new storm and the ocean to give an overall natural blues. And then I've, this is a more traditional sort of fur owl patterning, and I've linked it with the the checkerboard pattern, which I used. Um, it's a slightly different pattern, but I used that same idea on a design in Shetland, the Ninian cardigan, which I really liked. I like um, that combination. Yeah, and then obviously I combined it with the, the two-colour rib as well. So so that creates more of a an aura. So I, I would tend to do that type of colouring for menswear more so than women's wear because I think it's more of a masculine sort of look than on women's wear. Now I like the way you've done the shoulders and the armholes. There's some shaping in the shoulders. It it looks drop shouldered, but is it? No, it, it's knitted it, it is drop shot well it's more what we yes, call a J sleeve. Yes, you've got some shaping yeah. under here which takes bulk out. Yeah. So it's yeah. a, a J sleeve. It's completely knitted in the round. Um, and then the, so you've got steaks here yeah. and then the armholes knitted downwards but it's so. nicely shaped yeah. it's not like an 80s drop shoulder no 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 no, yeah. no. and there's shaping and up there's, here there's too shaping so on, that, that's on beautiful as well. so most of the men's wear is, has, has got J sleeves on it which is that's got a J sleeve as well I really I love both designs but I've been hanging out for you to, to make some men's garments because <laughs> I really wanted to knit one for Andrew and oh. he would look stunning in that. <laughs> yeah, he would have done, yeah. It's his it's, sort it's of colouring. beautiful, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's great. So can we now see some of the female designs and maybe have a look at uh, a couple of the sketches if you've got a couple of sketches to yeah. go with them? Yeah. Right, so... Um, Andrew is here showing the whole collection. So this is the garments. I do this really. It helps me um, when I come to style for the photography shoot, but it also shows the balance of the collection as well. So um, this is the whole thing for, so some of those will be in Cumbria and some will be in Westmoreland. But as you can see here, and we've got like a peplum um, stitch um here and then we've got a very sort of fitted cardigan here and then we've got some oversized garments here so I can run through and show you I've got some of them I can show you um, now so you can see that Andrew's actually wearing this one here which is Rydal. Um So this gives you a good overview doesn't it when yeah. you're styling clothes? Yeah for the it photo makes shoot? it easier for me to to style and also um, a shot count when we come and do the actual photography shoot so you make sure that you've not missed anything out, that type of thing. And we've done the same thing there on the menswear as well. So we've already shown you two of the designs there so you can see all six there. There are some accessories as well but I don't, don't tend to sketch them out. I think so. it's so exciting that you've got all these men's designs. <laughs> Well, I just hope the men out there well, like them. Well, lots of partners yeah. will be uh, busy knitting them, yeah, I'm Mark, sure. Mark's already put his name on, on, on that one. Catherine, yeah. Okay, good. Well, you better start knitting. <laughs> I know. Or, or get a knitter to knit for yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so that's good to see those. Yeah, so so this is some of the garments here. So we have got a Keswick here, which is just a plain um, stitch design. So it uses a twisted stitch. Um, but I've put... Um, so it's like a raglan sleeve. It's all knitted in the round, but the shaping's all within the armhole to create a raglan sleeve effect there. Um, and then you've got a cabling overarm effect there. And I'm showing it in the book in two different colours. So we've got it in this colour here. And the back's and the, the same. The back's the same. This is very beautiful. Okay, and then there is another stitch design as well within the collection. Then we've got this one here, um, which is Glara Mara. Um, all the names are from um, the Lake District or the Yorkshire Dale, so the, the names of either villages or mountains or hills, that type of thing. Um, so this is one that's a, an all-over um, colour color work design, which is like similar to Primrose, if you like, from Gentle. Obviously a completely different design. It's all knitted in the round, and I've deliberately gone for the darks rather than the light, light lighter background. There. Yeah. So again, it can be made longer if you wanted by. You could just introduce some, some you know, another band further down That's before the shaping. Enough. Yeah, before the shaping starts that time. And of it's thing. got a funnel neck. No, it's not. It's just the way I put it on the neck. Okay, okay. <laughs> it's got a crease. It's more of a fitted. Yeah, it's more fitted around the neck. Um, as probably normally. But if you didn't want to do that, you wanted it wider, then you could leave off that last band. 
and you wanted a wider yeah. a wider neck. So tell us about this one. I what I love about this one, if I stand up a bit, you can see we've got stripes down here. That's similar to the breast uh, not the breaster. Uh, Sa- Sam Sam Free. Yeah, yeah, that's from Shetland, yeah. Which, which I, I mean I like, myself. Yeah. Yeah. To me, I mean, because I like to blend all the colours together. If I just put a solid welt there, it would just I don't know, it just wouldn't be me, if you know what I mean. So I have to put colour in the well if I'm using a big well. The only time I do a solid colour well really is if it's small. If it's a small small small, border. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. But this one, I did this one because I wanted something slightly simpler that people could work on. Um, Because the actual ferrule sections are quite simple and it's got a tiny little bit of stitch in it as Mm -hmm. well. Um, And it's got, you know... um, quite a bit of normal stocking stitch in there as well to to give people a breather yeah a breather <laughs> from the actual pattern so I think it's beautiful that. it's very soft it's still light yeah I love this grey yeah. and it's more of a yeah. modern shape as far as it's a slash neck and you've you've got yeah. the, rib, the ribbing detail across the across the top there yeah it's gorgeous so and it, again this is another one which is all knitted in around and it's steeped in the on what's the this one called Rydal Rydal remember that I'm sure people will love it <laughs> Okay, now what about this one? This has got a funnel neck. This one's a funnel neck and it's more of a boxy shape. It's called Bessie Boot. And um, yeah, so it's knitted flat. Um, I say it's wide. It's just a really good throw on jumper, really. Um, It's not fitted anyway, so it's it's cozy and comfortable to wear. So again, you could make it longer. You could make, make. you know, repeat that down there, so that creates more of a border there. That's probably the way I would would actually make that a little bit longer. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's more of a yeah, an easy to wear yeah sort of beautiful. Piece. And again, it's got the same kind of shoulder and um, yeah, it's got a jacket. It's, it's really beautiful. You can see shoulder. there's some um, shaping yeah. down here. Yeah, and yeah, I yeah. mean it is knitted flat, but I mean you can. You can knit my garment, the flat one, knitted ones, in the round, but you'd have to introduce the steak where the seam yeah. is, basically. But you could knit it in the round to here, couldn't you? you? Well, you could. The you were still steak, but could the actual pattern wouldn't match. Do you know what I mean? It's not okay. a continuous pattern. Yeah. That's the difference, you see. Okay. And yes. um, the pattern doesn't repeat all the way around. Okay. So I suggest that if you want to knit in the round, you would actually stick it. I see it, that, yeah. Put steaks in for yeah. the, the seams and the armholes. Yeah, which is, once you've done it on one garment, you just repeat the yeah. same procedure. Yeah. Okay, and we've got a vest. Yes, which this is, is great. Paris, um, which is a really sweet little vest. Um, I, again, I wanted to do another vest, but I wanted to make it a crew rather than a, a V. Um, just because it's a little bit more contemporary. Um, it's quite short as well, so it sort of sits just above the hip. Um, but again, you can make it longer just to introduce Again, you could take that pattern there and then just put that, start with that pattern if you like, mm. just straight after the rib so it doesn't have to run in. So, yeah, so they're easy to make longer. So it's And since you're when you're talking about sticking here in the side seams, if you ever want to put uh, waist shaping in, mm. you can also oh, you can do, do that yeah, yeah. via a stick, yeah. you know, on either side of the stick, yeah. and that's just a very easy increase way. Increase and decrease yeah. either side of the stick, yeah. Okay, that's beautiful. And and then we've got this one here, which is a tunic, which is called Lingmore. Um, it's a really nice tunic, which is more of a, a grey. The base is the silver birch, which is more grey. So it's more of a complicated pattern. So it's probably a little bit more difficult for people to, you know, for the experienced mm-hmm. knitter really needs to have a go at this one. But again, it's this one is knitted flat, but again, you could knit it in the round um, with introduction of, of the steaks there. It hasn't got any waist shaping, but as you say, you, if you wanted you to add that, in, that in. you can put all that in. So Okay, so this is one of the more difficult ones. This is one of the more easier yeah. ones for a fair hour. I wouldn't say any of my designs are easy <laughs> But actually, you just need to go slowly. Yeah, absolutely. Just I mean, at the end of the day, they look complicated. I always say they look complicated, but they're only ever two colours in a row. Yes. So, yes. you know, once exactly. you've done... So once you've done one... Yeah, exactly. And this one, how would you go to that middle experienced? Um, sort of middle. They're all middle, really. That The one you're wearing is probably the, the easiest, easiest one to start with. Easiest one to start with. Um, but yeah, that's m- middle. Again, it's... It's split into sections, so there are the definite sections, and you've got a bit more stocking stitch in between, mm. so it is a little bit 
Okay. So. Now, how many out of the 22 designs, how many are not fair are? Like, um, well, there's two stitch ones in the women's part. So there's 10 women's. Um, so eight of fair are, two are stitch. So this, I'm just talking about garments here, they're yes, not, not the yes. accessories. And then the men's wear, there's two stitch ones and four fair are. That's a wonderful collection. Mm. Yeah. So. Oh, and I must say on the stitch ones for the men's, I've done something different because I've knitted them with two ends together. So um, so I've knitted it like an iron weight. Um, so for our American friends, a worsted weight. So it's knitted on four and a half millimetre needles. So it's actually knitted with two ends together. Okay, and so that's a quicker a, knit. Yeah, it creates a really nice, um, bouncy um very 3D effect fabric and it's given me an idea that I might actually introduce a, an iron weight version of British Breeds and a select mm. colours just for that type of knitting so that okay. might happen next year or the year after. So <laughs> in total you've actually published 13 books mm. with three new books coming out mm. and um, so tell us what has evolved with your designing and pattern writing during this time? Well obviously I'm doing it as an independent designer. So the main difference for me from what, from working for myself to working for, for someone else is the freedom to do what I want to do. And pattern and colour has always been my first love. And when you work for someone else, you're not necessarily able to do that because you have to design to briefs, you have to design to that particular market, if you, if you like. So... Um, so now I'm very lucky to be able to design what I want to do and people like it. I'm very fortunate that people actually like what I do. So um, so I'm not going to change. You know, you won't ever find me do anything simple knits or anything mm. like that because that's just not me. Mm. And there's so many other good designers out there that do yeah. would do a better job than me doing that. So. And since you've left Rowan and you've been going to more like the Edinburgh Yarn Festival mm. and Yarndale, mm. you've had a lot more personal contact with, yes. with knitters, haven't you? Yeah. And has that helped? Has that changed in any way, the way you write patterns or feedback or um, anything like that? It's great. I mean, I love meeting people. I love, you know, meeting, doing the shows is one of my favorites. It's hard work. You know, it is exhausting, as you know. But um, but it's great fun as well, isn't yeah. it? I mean, you meet some really lovely people, and um, and it's always interesting to hear what people have got to say about your work and everything. You know, people are very complimentary and, and things, and I, I do take you know when um, quite a few people at Yarndale and Edinburgh Yarn Festival wanted to see it would have been nice to introduce sort of a heathery tone or a red. So that's so I have deliberately so you listened, can and directly, that's where yeah. thistle came. Where I introduced thistle. And, you know, so I do listen to people, you know, and, and things. And it's, it's, it's just lovely to be able to... In fact, I've got more, a lot more contact now with my customers than I ever did yes. when I was at Rowan. Absolutely, so, yeah. So it's really nice to have that interaction. And I'm very open, you know, if people want to ask me questions or whatever, then just email me and I always answer, so... That's great. Yeah. Okay, so one last question. Recently, your husband Mark yeah. has joined you full time in the business. Yeah. Now, sometimes couples who don't <laughs> work together are very curious about couples who do manage to work together. Yeah. So we want to know how it's going for you and Mark. Are there any challenges? And what's the best thing about being a husband and wife team? Well, I suppose the biggest challenge was right at the beginning was my you know, when I suggested to Mark, because Mark's job was coming to an end, he was going to get made redundant, and then obviously the pandemic happened. So he's been working with me for just over a year. And and I said, well, come and work with me, sort of thing. And and he was um and ahhing and everything, and then he decided to. And I thought, what have I done? <laughs> because I thought, we just won't, might not get on, you know, he might not get on and we'll end up getting divorced or whatever. <laughs> and, um, and it was, you know, so it... it but it didn't happen like that. I mean, we work, I work upstairs at the minute because we obviously were in our small cottage at the minute. So I work upstairs and Mark works in the other room. And it works really well. In actual fact, it's probably brought us closer together as a couple. So, and now he really appreciates what I do. Whereas before, he never really took much interest, but now he does. And he always tries to impress me by, you know, if I lift a design up, he can say what it is and what colour <laughs> is that, like, so. <laughs> 
So he know. really wants you to knit yeah. him a design, doesn't he? <laughs> he does, yeah. Well, the poor thing's been waiting, what, how long have we been married? 26 years. <laughs> and he hasn't had one? No, not yet. You've, you've got a sort of, you're knitting. He's you've had got a beanie, that's about it. <laughs> I have to teach him to knit to make his yeah. own. Yeah. Okay, well, look, it's been really wonderful to have you on Fruity Knitting again. So thank you so well, much for giving great. us your time. Oh, well, I've loved it. It's Good. always lovely to speak to you, so. Let's say goodbye to the audience. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.